Hey, Chapel Street Church. You know, it's no secret that the war in Ukraine is a terrible tragedy. We should all be on our knees, praying for an end to the violence and the hostilities in that region. As a church family, a couple of years ago, we helped to build Stephen's Home, a ministry to men with uh, disabilities that are, that are desperately in need of care. Elise West and her team have done a remarkable job of building that ministry. But that home is in Kherson, a city that's been embattled uh, under the Russian invasion. And those men and the workers have had to flee. They're currently in Odessa, hoping to relocate to Romania until the war is over. So we just ask you to continue to pray for provision, protection, and end to the war, and that the home would stay standing so they could return one day and continue the, the important work they started there. Many of you have asked how you can support relief for refugees in Ukraine. Well, we're pleased to tell you that Matt and Sarah Titus are Serve the World missionaries in the Czech Republic, and they are right now receiving and preparing to receive more refugees from Ukraine coming through Poland into the Czech Republic. And they've sent us a message specifically outlining how we can help them with the great work that God is doing. Hey, Chapel Street. Just want to say hi from the Czech Republic. Um, and in my garage right now, you can see it's become a bit of uh, like a warehouse hub these days. Uh, I want to say thanks so much to everybody who's been giving, helping make some of this refugee relief uh, possible. We're going to stay active at it for as long as we can. We've been helping to get apartments ready for more long-term living for people, kind of midterm, more long-term sort of. We've been delivering supplies to locations that can get it across the border to the Ukraine, so actually into the country. And then we've also been helping delivering supplies at big refugee centers where people are coming in, they're only staying for like a few days before they find more permanent housing, like the apartments that we've been finding and re remodeling and doing reconstruction and outfitting for. So it's been crazy busy. It's been an amazing opportunity to be involved in all of it. We're so thankful that we're here in the midst of so much tragedy and that we're able to help and that we're able to do it in, in the name of Jesus and as a church. I think it's such a powerful witness um, that we can actually be the hands of feet and feet of Christ in the midst of such, such a terrible thing. So thank you again so much for everything and for your continued support. Like I said, uh, it's kept us going, it's motivated us, it's literally given us the funds to do all of this relief work. And as long as that's still there, we're gonna keep at it. We're gonna keep pushing at it as best we can. So thanks so much, love you guys. So we want you to know that any gift you give to serve the world in this season will help missionaries like Matt and Sarah Titus for the important work they're doing to help these people who are displaced, who are looking for not only material provision, but for hope, and we can give them the hope of the gospel. Well, you heard from Matt, and Matt Titus and his wife Sarah and their family in, in the Czech Republic doing great work. And thanks to, for those of you who pray and support. Uh, we're grateful for their work there. And, now, and, and as he said, they're doing it in the name of Jesus. They're sharing not only physical provision, but spiritual hope as well. And uh, let's bow now and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, thank you for the way that you provide for us. We take so many things for granted, especially sitting here in the relative comfort and ease. We take for granted the fact that we're not fleeing our homes. You've blessed us in ways that we don't deserve. And not, every, not everyone in the world experiences. So we, we pause now and acknowledge that you've given us so much. Not to make us feel guilty, but grateful and responsible. And you've given us your word so we might know who you are. And understand what it is you have to say to us. We pray that you'd open our minds and hearts to it now. In Jesus' name, amen. We are starting a new series. If you were here for our Easter services, we had such a great time across all of our campuses. You know, I was telling our staff, we had zero people in person for worship two years ago, 2020, like most churches, only online. I stood right here and preached to an empty room on Easter. It was the worst. 
And then in 2021, we had 2,000 people. And this year, we had over 4,400 people gathered at Easter. So really praising God that people are regathering. I don't think we'll be at 8,000 next year. I'm not gonna keep doubling, but uh, there won't be room. But it was great to see people coming back together to worship. And in case you've forgotten, he's still risen. He's still risen and he's still reigning. And we're starting a new series uh, that I think is a perfect follow-up to Easter called The Greatest Chapter. Now, I know some of you are like, but, how, but is it really? Is it the greatest? I mean, we love to debate the greatest, don't we, in our culture? You listen to shows and it's the greatest quarterback, the greatest team, the greatest, well, by the way, the greatest team of all time is the 85 Chicago Bears. I can settle that one now. But, right, the, the greatest game, the greatest song, the greatest movie, the greatest book. Well, what's the greatest chapter in the Bible? Well, first of all, the Bible wasn't written in chapters, so this would not be a debate that people in the first century would be having. They didn't have chapters and verses, but we mean the greatest section. Genesis 1's pretty good. Psalm 23 is pretty good. You know, John 1. But at least if there's a Mount Rushmore of great chapters, I think Romans 8 is in the pantheon. It's in the list because of what it contains, because of all that it's, it starts with this declaration, no condemnation, and it ends with this statement, no separation. Verse 1, which is going to be our focus this morning, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Verse 39, the last verse, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And in between, it talks about our relationship to the Father, the power of the Spirit, our future hope and glory. I mean, it just contains so much for us. I thought I knew this chapter, but God is reawakening my mind and heart to all that he has for us. And I'm excited for me and for you, for all of us as a church family, as we go through this chapter together. I don't know of another chapter that more powerfully combines uh, and explains the brokenness of our world, how it got that way, and what God's solution is for it. Or more beautifully puts together our, um, our longing for it to be different than it is in our lives in this world, our suffering with our future glory. Or more, uh, like, consistently and clearly explains who the Spirit is and what the work of the Spirit is meant to be in the life of a believer, a Jesus follower. Or explains our deep need as human beings to know that we're accepted by God the Father and how that can be true. And on down the list. Romans 8 has it all. And again, it begins by offering us the two most amazing words that any soul could hear. No condemnation. Those two words have more power to lift you out of despair, to put your fears to rest, to give you hope, to deliver you from doubt. No condemnation. However, to make sense of this, this, this statement, no condemnation, we have to back up. Um, because Romans is, is, a, is a book full of rich theology, and it's, it's, it's deep uh, and rich, and it's not, you're not skimming across the surface of Romans. You're not going to understand uh, what's going on there. Paul wrote uh, what many consider to be the greatest work of, of Christian theology ever written, the, the, this letter to the Christians in Rome, we call Romans. But he's, from Romans 1 through 7, he's saying something, and specifically, let's look at Romans 7, verses 21 through 25. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members, he means my body, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And pause there. Do you hear what he's saying? Deep down inside, I really want to obey God. I really want to be faithful and obedient and follow him. But I, I struggle with this. Anybody relate? I want to. If you peel to back enough layers, I don't always act like it, but in my soul, I want to be who he wants me to be. But I battle with this and I do the things I don't want to do. And I don't do the things that I want to do. And then he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I want you to pay attention to the word, whoop, deliver there. Actually, we've got to have to change the color. This is fun. This won't show up. Whoop. What color should I use? I don't know. Ha ha. Yes, right. Green. Okay, green. Somebody yell green. All right. Who will Deliver me. That looks weird. <laughs> the word deliver is important. It's a particular word that means rescue, um, save, but literally means to pluck out of. Paul's saying, I'm in this condition where I want to follow God, but I struggle to carry that out. Who will lift me out of this condition and save me from it, deliver me from it? He's asking a question that really chapter 8 answers. Now he tells us, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's answering the question. But in chapter 8 is this rich explanation of how. How is it that Jesus delivers us from this condition we're all in? So that's 
in brief what he's doing and why and what he's saying when he says no condemnation. It's crucial for us. You know, when you call 911, if you ever do, if you're in a crisis, hopefully you're not, but if you ever find yourself in a crisis and you call 911, the call does not save you, does it? I mean, it's a good thing to call, but what saves you? It's not a trick question. It's not magic, I called, therefore I'm better. Somebody has to show up and deliver you and do the work of saving you, right? So that biblical faith works that way. The crying out to God is the 911 call, but he's the savior, he's the one who delivers us. We don't really do anything there other than cry out to him, and there's no hope for us unless he shows up. And Paul's gonna explain to us how he shows up and what he does in our lives. Let's look at verses one through four of chapter eight. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now there's a lot in there, uh, in these few sentences. Um, Paul is saying, if you're in Christ, and we're gonna talk about what that means in a minute, there's no condemnation. Let me put it this way. For those of you that are in Christ Jesus, means you've trusted in Jesus by faith for the forgiveness of your sins. There is no valid reason why you should ever question, doubt, or suspect that God doesn't love you and hasn't forgiven you. That doesn't mean you won't ever suspect, doubt, or question. It means there's no valid reason why you should. Do you understand the difference? Paul is saying, if you're in Christ, there is no reason why you should ever question the love of God. You, you do do sometimes, but there's no good reason for it. And the, our job then is to be reminded, oh no, wait a minute, I'm in Christ. There's no reason for this doubt. He's already told me, no condemnation. No condemnation. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who wrote nine sermons on Romans 8, 1 through 5 alone. So you're getting off easy, just one this morning. <laughs> writes it this way. There are many who misunderstand this. They seem to think the Christian is a person who if he confesses his sin and asks for forgiveness, is forgiven. At that moment, he's not under condemnation. But then, he should, or she should sin again, you're back under condemnation once more. Then you repent and confess and ask for pardon and you're cleansed once more. And so the Christian is this person who moves from condemnation to no condemnation. Confession, right, and, and forgiveness. And we sort of go back and forth. And many of you feel this way, don't you, in your life? Screwed up, guilty, condemned, confess, oh, I feel better. He's saying this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what a Christian is. Now that, according to the apostles, is a wholly mistaken notion and a complete failure to understand the position. The Christian is one who can never be condemned again, can never come into a state of condemnation. No condemnation means no, none. The Greek word for no means no, right? <laughs> There's no condemnation. The apostle is not talking about our feelings or our experience, he says, but our position, our status. We want to define our relationship by how we feel in a moment, but Paul is saying your relationship with God is not dependent on how you feel or how you behave in the moment, because that fluctuates. It's dependent on who Christ is and what he's done, because you're in him. No condemnation. You can never again come under condemnation. That is such good news. This brings us to the first point, a new verdict. Let's be honest about the word condemnation for a minute. It's not a fun word, is it? It's not a pleasant word. It's kind of an ugly word. We use it to describe buildings that are dilapidated and unfit to live in, right? This building is condemned. It's gonna be torn down. Politicians condemn the evil acts. We, we condemn the aggression and violence and war crimes of Vladimir Putin in Russia, right? We say things like that. Or, or if someone's on death row, they're condemned to die. It's not a word that's very pleasant if you think about it. So what does Paul mean when he uses it to describe us? No condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. Let's look at verse 8, 1. No condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now implies what? That there once was condemnation. 
that there was a point at which we were under condemnation. This is, I know this is going to make some of you uncomfortable. It implies that there was condemnation before, and it's, this is what we need to be delivered from. The Bible is clear from beginning to end throughout the Old and New Testament that we, though we're made in the image of God, have messed things up by our sin and rebellion. And I'll put it to you simply this way. The Bible is clear throughout that we are human beings born into a state of alienation from God. We are uh, rebelling against God, which brings us guilt before God, which puts us justly under the condemnation of God. Let me say that again. By nature, we are born alienated from God, rebelling against God, guilty before God, which puts us just under the just condemnation of God. Intellectually, we don't like to hear that, but deep down, we all feel it. Psalm 51.5, David is saying, Surely I was sinful at birth, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Meaning it's, a, it's my condition apart from Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, As it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understand, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Boy, Paul was having a bad day when he wrote this, wasn't he? Like, doesn't that sound like an overstatement? Like, hey, settle down, Mr. Negative, Right? Nobody does good. Don't some people do some things good now and then? He's not saying no human being ever does something good on a relative scale. Of course we do. What he's saying is, at the core, only God is good. Even though we may do good deeds or think good thoughts, we are not, any of us, even the best of us, purely motivated for anything. For something to be quote-unquote good in the sight of God, it must be good in the act itself and perfectly motivated. Which of us are perfectly motivated for anything? Uh, Jonathan Edwards wrote a book called The Nature of True Virtue, in which he said, um, we foster the seeds of sin in our efforts to make ourselves better people. How many of you have ever grew up in a family where your dad said something like this? We don't act that way, we're Frasers. Or they, you're not Frasers, but Smiths or whatever, right? Fostering pride of self and family to try to behave. Or you better not do that or you're gonna get it fostering fear of punishment to make ourselves behave, to make people behave. Even in our efforts to act right, we, we foster, stir up fear and pride, the very roots of sin. In other words, his point is, when it comes to God's holy standard, none of us measure up. And if you meet somebody who you think is really like a truly good person, you know what's amazing about them is you get to know them? They are, the, the best people among us are highly aware of their need for grace and their sinfulness, aren't they? The really good people, they're not going, have you noticed how good I am? <laughs> I mean, I'm better than most of you. But no, they are deeply humble and aware of their failures and their failings. That's what Paul's saying. We are under the just condemnation of God. That's what makes the proclamation, no condemnation, so amazing, if we understand it. If we don't, it's just like, yeah, okay, good, I guess. But the verdict is based on something. I think part of our problem is this. We, we live in a culture that tells us the opposite of what the gospel actually says. Our culture says to you and to me in so many ways that we're not even aware of that the, the problem is always out there with those people, with the Republicans, with the Democrats, with the liberal left, which the, with the alt-right, with the, with the educational system, with the economy, with the, you know, the problem is always someone and somewhere else. And the solution is in here. Be true to yourself. Obey your inner desires. Get in touch with your deepest sense of who you are. And that's the solution to live a, a good and fulfilled life. But the gospel says exactly the opposite. The problem isn't out there. It's in here. It's right in here. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his book, The Gulag Archipelago, says that the line between good and evil doesn't run between nations and civilizations. It runs right down the middle of every human heart. I'm the problem, right? And the solution is not in me if I'm the problem. The solution is outside of me. Jesus Christ, who comes into my life from the outside. I don't muster him up. Do you understand the difference? This is what Paul means when he's saying that there's no condemnation. We were under condemnation, and we need a rescuer from outside of us, a deliverer. 
So the condemnation over us is very real apart from Jesus. And this makes it all the more amazing that he would say no condemnation to us if we're in Christ. Regardless of how you might feel, regardless of the heaviness of your heart when you think of all the ways you've failed, or the guilt that you carry around, the shame of your past, things you've done or done to you, if you're in Christ, there's no valid reason why you should ever doubt the love of God for you. 1 John 3.20 says, even when our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. I love that verse. Our hearts do condemn us sometimes, don't they? Even though we know better, we lie to ourselves. We're ten- Some of you are this kind of person. How could a good God ever forgive such a wretched screw up like me? Some of you are this kind of person. How could a good God ever condemn a decent person like me, right? Neither one gets the gospel right. The only sin that can ever be truly dealt with in our lives are the sins that we know have been forgiven. We're not condemned for. You'll, you will make very little progress in your spiritual life until you come to deeply in your soul know and believe no condemnation. I'm forgiven. That's the gospel's motivation for you to live an obedient life. Not fear and guilt and, and obligation and duty, but the freedom and joy of knowing you are not condemned because of what Christ has done. Nothing, I think, paralyzes us human beings like shame and fear. And nothing sets us free like the love of God, knowing we're not condemned. This is our gospel. Grace is a much greater motivation than guilt. Freedom so much greater than fear. When I was an athlete, many, you take it on faith now, but years ago, I used to be, <laughs> many years ago, played uh, high school and college football. And I, the, the greater, as I grew as an athlete in my, my career playing, the great, you know, fear will get you so far. Fear of the coach benching you, fear of getting called out, wanting, you know, fear of failure. That, that, that is a motivational force. Or, you know, anger at your opponents. But the greater motivator is love is the joy and freedom I get to do this. That's an imperfect reflection of what the motivation in our life of the gospel is meant to be. No condemnation. So how does this happen specifically? How does this happen? Let's look at verses two through three. Now this is, we're gonna get into some, uh, some, some deeper theology here, so put on, your, put on your theologian caps. For the law of the spirit of life, when Paul uses the word law here, he's not talking about legal code. He's talking about operating principle, like the law of gravity, uh, or, or like a, a, a operating um, principles or operating system in our lives. For the operating system of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus, there it is again, in Christ Jesus, from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, now this is what's confusing, here, Paul's using the word law to refer to legal code, the Old Testament law. In English, it doesn't translate, it gets a little wonky. Weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. Let's unpack this as we go, bit by bit, because it's, I know you probably read that and go, what? But it's really, really important and really good. God has done for us what we were powerless to do for ourselves by sending his son. Paul's giving us a critical contrast here between these two operating principles. The law, the operating system and principle of the spirit of life, the Holy Spirit of gospel life, and the law of sin and death, which is based on our inability to measure up to God's holy standard. So the law of the spirit of life, the law of sin and death. Paul's describing how for us in verse three, we're set free from this. So in verse three, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Weakened by the flesh means this. The law of God, his requirements for us, his holy standard for us is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. It's weakened by our flesh, our sinfulness. We cannot obey it. We cannot measure up to it on our own. If we could, we would not need a savior, but we cannot. Therefore, it's powerless to save us. The law can't save you. The problem's in you and in me, not in the law, but it can't save you because you can't keep it, make sense? But God sends his son to do for us what we could not do, we can't keep the law. 
punish the sin that, that we deserve the punishment for and keep the law on our behalf, in us, as it were. Okay, he, so he sends his son. And notice what he says here, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus is like us, but he's not the same as us. He's fully human, but he's without sin. If you're on a ship that's sinking, you need someone to save you who's like you, meaning they're close enough to you to save you. Remember that question, who will deliver me? Who will snatch me out of this condition? Who will pluck me out of this sinking situation that I'm in? They have to be close enough like you to do that, but they can't be the same as you or they're just going down with the ship like you are. Like you don't need it. Nobody can deliver you if they're just going down with the ship as you are. How can they save you? This is the message of Jesus, right? He's like us. He comes into our world close enough to save and redeem and forgive and set us free. But he's not like us at all because he's perfect. He's without sin. He's our deliverer. He's the one who, only one who can do that. That's what Paul is saying. And notice this phrase, and for sin. I'm really liking this green color. And for sin. Some of your translations might say as a sacrifice for sin. And that's a, that's a more accurate understanding of what he's saying there. Paul sent his son in the likeness, or God sent his son, in the likeness of human flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. He sent him and for sin as a sacrifice for our sin to die in our place. This brings us, let me put it this way. God, by his spirit, draws us to faith in his son who gives us life because he died and was condemned with the death and condemnation that we deserve. That's what sets us free. Simply put, the Holy Spirit brings to us a life in the place of condemnation by leading us to faith in Jesus Christ who suffered that condemnation in our place. This brings us to a new identity. A new identity. This is the phrase, in Christ, which shows up over and over again here in Romans and in most of Paul's letters. In Christ. No condemnation is not an indiscriminate, universal sort of declaration across the whole world. I've said this before, but the gospel invitation is as wide as the world and as narrow as the cross. It doesn't matter your race, color, creed, background, or family. All are invited in. The extent, the invitation of grace and freedom is extended to all people, every nation, tribe, and tongue, but only those who are in Christ can rightly understand and feel and know the freedom of no condemnation declared over them. Only those who are in Christ. Look at verses one and two again. In Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. For the law of sin and death. What does it mean to be in Christ? This is not describing some next level spiritual status that you achieve when you get really mature. It's saying, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You might not have your life together. You might still be struggling, as Paul describes in Romans 7, with sin. You might have lots of hang-ups. You might have lots of baggage. But you know that you know that he's your only hope, and you've repented of your sin and surrendered your life to him and received the forgiveness that he offers you in Christ. Don't always feel like it. Don't always live like it. But it's true of you. That's what Paul is saying. That's our new identity. When I was, uh, Tom was talking about his role as, as high school pastor and his amazing job, he and the whole team of student ministries, I know he'll tell you this, uh, it's the same as when I was high school pastor many, many, many years ago. The number one question adolescents are asking is, who am I? Where do I belong? Who am I, really? Am I what my friends think, my parents say, my coaches say? Am I what social media says? Who, who am I? And do you know what? It's the same question all of us are asking as we get older. We're just a little more sophisticated at hiding it. Who am I? And the gospel is answering it. You are in Christ. You belong to him. No condemnation over you. No matter where you are geographically or what you do occupationally, you are spiritually never, you're unchangeably always in Christ. Not when you get older and more mature, not when you get your life together, not when you sort some things out. Always unchangeably in Christ. And that means no condemnation, freedom. Now, if the message of the gospel is just this, hey, God forgives your sin, and you get into heaven for all eternity, 
but you're pretty much on your own to figure out the rest, it would still be amazing news. Forgiveness and eternity with God, that's worth praising him for all my life. But it's, you ever see those commercials for Ginsu knives? But wait, there's more, right? Well, how much would you pay for a knife that cuts shoes or whatever, right? But wait, there's more. It's the gospel, that Romans 8 is saying, yes, forgiveness for all your past and the condemnation you deserve. Take it away. Yes, eternity secure for you, but there's more. There's so much more. This, is, this brings us to a new power. A new power. So the new verdict is no condemnation because of what Christ has done. The new identity is I'm in Christ. And the new power is the phrase according to the Spirit. Remember Paul's question in Romans 7? Who will rescue me? Who will deliver me? He doesn't just mean deliver me from the present, like from the past, but from the present power of sin in my life. That's what he's wrestling with. Who will get me out of this situation that I'm in? We need both the forgiveness of our past and the condemnation removed that we justly deserve. We need also someone in our lives to help us be what we cannot be on our own. Imagine for a minute somebody who, who struggles with anger. I, I, I did for many years. Uh, as an, I don't know, I won't blame uh, athletics, but it was in me, it's my own sin, but it, it manifested in rage when I was a young man. My wife could tell you early in our marriage it wasn't good. Uh, we'd get angry, fly up the handle. What if the gospel is this? Jeff, God doesn't hold your rage and your outbursts against you anymore. You will not be condemned for that. That's good news. You're forgiven. You get into heaven. But you're pretty much on your own to get that under control. So good luck to you. See you in heaven. Right? What if that was the gospel? <laughs> your wife and kids, they're just going to have to endure it. No. The gospel is, yes, you're forgiven for your past. Yes, condemnations are removed from you. And you are given the resurrection power, the spirit in you to help you live in a way you could not otherwise, to obey him right now. This, this is the new power. It's referred to, the spirit is referred to 21 times in Romans 8, five times in Romans 1 through 7. Paul, it's like Paul saying, you can't conceive of or talk about the Christian life unless you understand the role of the Spirit. And I'll be honest with you, I'm still just beginning to understand all that the Spirit is meant to do in my heart and my life. He says so much more for us. The good news of the gospel is this. God forgives and removes the guilt and condemnation you deserve, and he comes into your life to change you. I'll put it this way. God sends his Son to remove the condemnation of sin's penalty. God sends his Spirit to remove the condemnation of sin's power. And we need both, don't we? We need the penalty removed, and we need, the, we need a new power in our lives. How good is God? How good is our God? When you, when you sing about Christ the Lord is risen today, or you sing, read the resurrection stories, and then, you, and then you get up on Monday and it snows, which that's just here, but right here, and you go back to life, like what difference? No, no, that power is available to you in your life. Right now. This is what we need. Look at verses two and four once more. For the law of the Spirit, the Spirit is capitalized, it means the Holy Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Remember Paul's struggle? I can't live it out. The Spirit comes in and says, I'm going to help you do it. I'm going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. To walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. When does this happen? Now. Now. God does not leave us on our own to muddle through until heaven. He comes into our life right now. We'll look at Romans 8, 1, one more time. I want to end with this, this amazing verse. No condemnation. This is what you need to hear. No condemnation. Friends, God's attitude toward you I, want you, I, I don't know all of you what goes on in your mind and hearts or what it's like when you go home to your families and the rest of your week, but I know some of you, but I can guess it's like me. You struggle to live this out. God's attitude toward you, if you are in Christ, is not condemnation. It's not disappointment. It's not anger. It's not you ought to be better than you are. It's love. He deeply desires for you to be the woman or the man that he made you to be. And he's not arms crossed in heaven hoping you figure it out. He's given you his spirit to reside in your heart to make you into that person. He's only asking you to surrender to the work of the spirit. 
to cooperate with what God is already trying to do in you. If you're suffering through a bad or disastrous day, or if you're having the best day of your life, you are always in Christ. There is no condemnation for you. How, how different would your life be if you really believe that? I mean, really. How different would your, would your occupation be? Would you, how different would you be at work if deep in your soul you believed there is no condemnation for me because I'm in Christ? Some of you are really good at condemning yourself. How dare you condemn what God has said, no condemnation? over your own heart. Some of you are good at condemning others. How dare you condemn those who are in Christ when God has said no condemnation? That doesn't mean we don't make judgments about right and wrong. It means the, the declaration of God in Christ for all who belong to him is no condemnation. And that is the most liberating thing we could ever hear. We're only four verses in. How great is this series gonna be when we get to the rest of Romans 8? But for now, as we, as we wrap up and you get ready to stand and worship and pour out your heart in song to God, I want you to leave this place knowing if you're in Christ, God has spoken that word over your life and it can never be changed. If you're not in Christ, then it's a different story. And he invites you to know and to experience the grace and freedom he offers through his son. Let's pray. Father, you've been so good to us beyond what we deserve or can even imagine. Not only have you forgiven the sins of our past and removed the condemnation we justly deserve by suffering in our place, by sending your son Jesus. You come and reside in our hearts by your spirit, setting us free not only from sin's penalty but from its power. How different would we be if we believed deep in our soul that it's true that we're not condemned and it's really true that your spirit lives in us. Help us. Deep, Lord, to believe that at the deepest level of who we are and to live that way, we thank you, Jesus, in your name, amen. Church family, go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who removes the condemnation of sin's consequences and gives you the power to follow him, amen.